and I announced to my family this morning in my brand new brown corduroy leather elbow jacket that I was going off to discuss uh, with some really clever people the future of retail, my wife asked me why I was dressed like her dad. <laughs> my youngest daughter, however, said I looked really cool. <clears throat> and there's quite an interesting insight into that because you've got one generation who can remember Open University in the late 70s. <clears throat> and you've got another generation that's never lived without the internet and the technology that we'll reference in some of this presentation. The growth of farmers' markets, of butchers, of fishmongers on the high street, which you might be surprised to hear about, hopefully so you've seen some of this, is phenomenal in this technological uh, age. And whilst we, um, you know, we need to recognize the sort of you know, huge opportunities with technology, a lot of my um, view about the future of shopping is that the technology that we have at our fingertips and that's being de developed by some of the very smart folk that we've heard speak earlier um, is a facilitator, not necessarily a game changer in this context. I worked in the, uh, the dot-com, the sort of first really big bubble in the late 90s, and, uh, and we were forecasting to brands like Nestle and Burger King and Unilever and Procter and & Gamble that by 2005, the high street wouldn't exist. Everything would happen on the internet. How wrong we were. And we mustn't confuse the problems that we're seeing on the high street, the store closures from Arcadia, the challenges that some of the more ubiquitous retailers are having with a future trend. They're much more to do with the economic challenges that we're facing at the moment. Now, shopping, we all do. I was going to do a, everybody put your hands up if you've been shopping in the last few days. But there can't be anybody in here that, that hasn't been shopping. We spend over a third of our income in shops, online and offline. In the UK, um, uh, last year, we spent 300, uh, or the thick end of 300 billion pounds um, through retail challenge, uh, channels. And the definition, which uh, comes from Wikipedia, uh, or part of the definition, is quite interesting, because it is all about the selection and or purchase um, of, of goods. And importantly, and in some contexts, it is considered a leisure activity. And I think in the context of technology and online environments and trying to do everything from our homes, uh, these things need to be considered. We need to recognize that successful retail must be relevant to shoppers' needs. And in this slightly polarized example, you might consider that the original shoppers, hunter-gatherers as we used to call them in retail marketing circles, probably wouldn't have considered Tesco, Home Delivery, and Click and Connect as a useful tool in the armory. We shop for what we have to have, our food and the stuff that keeps us alive, and we shop for the stuff that we like to have or we need. And critically, and a very big part of retail and the experience that we get from retail, is the stuff that we shop for that we aspire to. These great big scary but beautiful brands that we think change our lives. And when we shop, <clears throat> we sometimes shop for ourselves, we sometimes shop for our families, and sometimes we shop for others, I think gifting. And the reason why I'm talking to you about these blindingly obvious observations in this is that all of these things impact on how marketers and retailers and brand owners will perform better in the future. Some retailers, the smart ones, are the ones that recognize the shopper need or who's doing the shopping, and they demonstrate a benefit to that shopper. This is a, something I saw in a market. I wouldn't say it's cutting edge retail, but it's quite an interesting uh, observation um, that I saw in India. Now, price is what, if you ask any shopper, what's the most important thing for you when you go shopping? They go, price. It's all about price. It's all about the value um, which they associate with money off and half price deals and buy one, get one freeze and 
buy three for this and two for that and all the rest of it. You could reasonably argue as an anthropologist that this stuff is designed to confuse the shopper, not aid the process that they go through. But if it was all about price, then we'd all shop here because this is where it's the cheapest. So we have to consider in the future of retail what is going to influence our decision-making process. And it's not just about price. Of course, it's about quality. It's about perceived quality. It's about what we think is best or what ingredients we consider will make what we buy a better purchasing decision. You'll see I've gone back to another beautiful market with fabulous things to buy. And critically, and nowadays, we used to call this the future uh, of retail, but it's, it's just part of our world now in the, in the more successful retailers. It's about the experience that the retailers bring to the party. And not just in a fluffy, make you feel better kind of way. Nestle Purina won't sell more cat food if they give you a massage in the pet food aisle in Tesco's. However, Apple sell loads more gear because they let you engage with the product and they let you see other cool people playing with the product. They make you aspire to it, as well as demonstrate the benefits of the stuff that they're selling. And it's what we call the value equation. And the value equation is the balance depending on who the shopper is, whether they're buying for themselves or somebody else, what their purchasing desires and needs are, the balance between what price you pay, what level of quality or perceived quality it is, and what experience you get along the way. And a good experience might be a get in and out quickly. It might be just a simple convenience experience. But other times it might be retail theatre and the excitement that they bring to the party. Now, <clears throat> shoppers themselves, us, and all the other people up and down the country and around the world have changed beyond recognition in the last 20 years. We used to all get profiled by social demographic profiling. We used to be rich or we used to be poor, which is the sort of slight generalisation of that very scientific way of profiling people. But now we've become a nation of smart shoppers. We've got shoppers who shop here, but they also shop here. We've got people going and buying their fruit and veg in Waitrose or their meat because of provenance and because of the service that they get, because of the treat, because it's a special occasion they're buying for, but they're buying their commodities in the store. And the really smart ones <clears throat> are not just going to Waitrose for their fruit and veg and Tesco's or Asda for their commodities, they're going to Lidl to buy their Parmesan, because the Parmesan is the same gear in Waitrose, but it's seven pounds a kilo less. Now, we can't ignore the internet. You might think I'm a bit old-fashioned in my brown corduroy jacket, not giving it a mention. Um, we've seen so many presentations about the growth of it, about the, 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 the scale of the engagement with the internet. Um, it's, it's been extraordinary, and in most of our lifetimes, we've seen it go from zero to nearly 100% of people that are either online or have been online or have access to online. Um, there was a, a situation, I'm not just going to talk about my family all, all, uh, all through this session, but my daughter was um, on her mobile phone the other day, and um, she was, no, no, she was on the landline like that the other day, but she was on her mobile phone like this, and she was on Facebook um, on the computer, um, which is quite alarming, more alarming because she was talking to the same person through all of these different channels. <laughs> but, but the point is, is that she has a community of people that are only used to communicating in this way. And despite what um, Susan Greenfield was saying this morning, when I share her concerns about this FaceTime um, in front of screens, um, they are more social. We used to just be able to talk to one person or send them a postcard. Now, when the, um, this internet luck really got going, um, it was really interesting to see how retailers polarized themselves. There were online retailers and there were high street retailers. And the online retailers said in their advertising, we beat high street prices. And the richer sounds, in this particular case, a consumer electronics retailer, said internet beating prices. So you've got this battleground all about price again, not about the <clears throat> experience. What's interesting to observe just doing the sort of research on this thing um, the other day was that richer sounds have bought Empire Direct <laughs> and they're now in bed together. We use the internet 
for comparing. A large proportion of us um, use the internet for seeing where we can get the best price or where we can get um, our products from. We use recommendations. Peer recommendation online is uh, nearly twice as powerful as advertising as um, uh, getting recommendations towards uh, products and brands. <clears throat> and some 67% of people online buy on recommendation. <clears throat> so using technology to kind of enhance this process feels like the way forward. This is uh, um, from Westfield where there's a, um, a, um, a camera set up where you can try on, you don't actually try on clothes, but it tries clothes on you and you can then send pictures of you in a new outfit from a, from a particular fashion retailer to your friends to see whether they think you look good in it before you then make the decision. Here's a very traditional retailer, department store, who have created a concept store uh, up in a Aberdeen that doesn't have any product in it at all. You can go to House of Fraser up there and sit in a lounge area, be given a nice cup of coffee, and browse on their iPads and their computers to buy your merchandise in the comfort of their store. Go figure. Um, this, not the most exciting picture of uh, retail best practice, but I don't know if anyone's seen this. This is Amazon's new initiative. Biggest barrier to um, the uh, challenges of, of uh, the likes of the Amazons of this world is that no one's at home to deliver the goods to. So they're putting kiosks in places like 7-Eleven and in office environments so that you can buy your stuff. They will deliver it at night so it's cheaper. And when you swipe your receipt, a little box opens and there's your product. So there's some really imaginative ways around some of the challenges that retailers are faced with. And, you know, mobile commerce, m-commerce, um, I mean, it's really exciting. The kind of app explosion on Android and Windows and, uh, and iPhone is extraordinary. You can go and pay your bill directly from your iPhone. You can scan your products um, in your fridge or the empty packaging as it um, runs out. Compile a shopping list, press the button, and Tesco's will bring it around a few days later. And there are even the sort of the, the scannable items around promotional activity where you can scan a QR code and get a, in this case, absolute branded experience. I should note, at the risk of sounding slightly cynical, that in the beer, wines, and spirits aisle, which is always at the back of the store, it's very rare that you can get a 3G connection. So just to sort of summarize on, on um, some of the sort of, you know, internet usage and, and, and put this into context, 60% of shoppers who use the internet use it to find a shop. 35% use it to research what to buy. 22% research where to buy it from, comparison sites and that sort of thing. And only 16% forecast this year, it's just been downturned from 18% down to 16%, uh, are actually making a purchase online. Now, going back to my demise of the retail high street in 1999, you could suggest on that basis that the internet's been an abject failure. Of course, we don't think that. But understanding the role of it going forwards and the role of online and technology and everything is going to be critical. Are we going to see the end of bricks and mortar? No, I don't believe we are. Are we going to see a radical change in the way people shop? Yeah, I think we will. But we mustn't forget the fundamental barriers. Remember last Christmas? Lots of people didn't get their Christmas presents. That 16% that might have been 18% might be the ones that aren't going to buy their Christmas presents online this year because the stuff couldn't get delivered. So what we're hopeful for, and this is my big idea to get judged tonight, is the teleportation device. I don't know if any of you can remember Star Trek. Wouldn't it be great if you could sit in the comfort of your own home and have your products materialize in front of you, choose them, send them back if you don't want them, get them brought to you uh, if you do. What we will see in the future is a more complex value equation. And it will need, it's, it's more complex because it needs to understand the different customer needs. It needs to understand what's more important to people along what we would call the path to purchase. And, and there are different sort of elements. So there's a kind of, we, we talk about multi-channel now as the kind of future of retail. It really is. It's the combination of mobile commerce and online and the store experience. 
And price, of course, will always be about discounts and promotions and loyalty and offers and that sort of thing. Quality will more and more become, become um, about the ingredients and provenance, where the stuff came from. It's ethical proposition um, in terms of how it got there in the first place. I mean, there are, there are food brand owners, um, the likes of which Kraft and Unilever, who are saying that health might be the new price in future. People will make purchasing decisions based on what is ethically or healthily a better choice. And we're seeing some of that anyway with you know, salt levels and health uh, levels and what have you. And then, of course, the experience. And the experience will come in the form of better service. It will come in the form of greater convenience. Um, and it will come in the form of entertainment, retail entertainment. And there are some good examples in real live retail environments. Um, we, you know, we can now, we don't have to go to any shops ever again. Um, we could do everything from the comfort of our home. But we do, and we like doing it, and it's a social thing. Sometimes we like to moan about it. But stores where you can go and buy, buy the kind of ingredient levels, there's a uh, shop in Germany where you can go and buy the bits to make up one meal that is costed. There are retailers that are doing, teaching you how to do the DIY for when you do the DIY. There are stores, as we know already, where you can go and engage with product and play with it and really get a sense of how useful it will be in your life. There are stores with ice walls in, so you can go and try out the outdoor wear and uh, experience the product before you go. This is going to be the role of internet in the future. You've got the likes of Morrison's creating pop-up restaurants in Soho to trial their premium ready meal products. You've got, and this again has been well documented, but you know, the, 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 the ability to do your shopping via a QR code system, a bit like Tesco Home Plus are doing in that bus stop that we saw earlier, to do your shopping in your lunch break. And I'm going to, um, uh, just before I quickly sort of summarise this, that this, this, is, this is going back to the kind of point about relevance. Um, it's becoming harder and harder to imagine a world without the internet. Um, it's become our marketplace. It's become our playground. It's become our collective memory. And fascinating statistics, like more two- to five-year-olds can play on a simple application than can tie their shoelace. But twice as many in this study that was done. Um, and, you know, even as far as Entertain Your Cat, Frisky's brand created an app. I spent the best part of Wednesday evening trying to get my cats to play this. Um, and, and being relevant to shoppers and, and, and ensuring that, you know, the important retailers aren't uh, putting forward pointless innovations, whether it's getting fit virtual beer top opener. Um, measuring how um, your uh, performance in bed, or not, as the case may be, um, is. So I'll leave you with three, in my view, uh, points on, on, on what I think the future of shopping is. The high street will not go away, but its role will change. Shoppers will continue to get smarter and will embrace multi-channel offerings and multi-sensory offerings as part of their purchasing process. And the winners of those will be those who cater for those shoppers' needs best and develop relationships with them, as Paul was saying, in the kind of branded relationship. Thank you very much. For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.